webinar is entitled When the Clock Strikes 50, Planning for Retirement, presented by Paula Singer and Gail Griffith. Paula Singer is owner and president of the Singer Group, a management consulting firm she founded in 1983. Her individualized approach and commitment to excellence have resulted in a track record of success with an impressive client list. With expertise in compensation, organization development, strategic planning, and change management, Paula brings a balance of broad perspective and specific focus to each project. Gail Griffith is the Deputy Director of the Carroll County, Maryland Public Library, responsible for public services and staff development. She also provides consulting services and organization development to a variety of public library, local government, and nonprofit agencies throughout the U.S. I'm now happy to introduce Paula and Gail. Gail Griffith. Yes. Good afternoon. This is Gail. Paula, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. And I just want to say that I am retired <laughs> from the position of Deputy Director at the Carroll County Public Library. And um, actually, that's going to be a little part of my story today. Oh. Um, let's see if I can get us where we need to be. Okay, here's what we're going to talk about. Um, in a little bit, I think it's going to be evident why we're talking about this topic, but let's be clear about what we're planning to cover and not cover. We are not covering the financial or health aspects of retirement. This webinar is really about the emotional, psychological, and sociological aspects of retirement. Uh, there are a number of emotional steps involved in making this transition which is what retirement is. We'll be talking about the elements of an ideal retirement to help you know what you need better so that you can plan Act 3 and anticipate your retirement, those things that you can do to get ready. And we are calling it Act 3, the stage of life. The first act was our youth, when we really were forming our adult selves, uh, experiencing adolescence, making friends, experimenting with hobbies, interests, relationships, a lot of things. Um, act 2 really was that building stage of life, the, all those years of work, marriages, kids, new <laughs> interests, uh, usually very productive years. And the third act, the one coming up uh, in our model, is about that time when you're still quite productive, but you're no longer working in the same way you were when you were younger and perhaps building your career. That, that Act 3 is basically our retirement years, and age 50 is about the time to start thinking about and planning for Act 3. For most of us, this act will begin at around age 60 to 65, depending on our health, wealth, and how much our current job fulfills us and provides some meaning in our lives. Okay, so we'd like to know who's in our virtual living room here. So we have a little poll that we want to put up, and we hope you can see that. Paula, is it down in the right-hand corner? No, I'm not seeing it. Okay, I did put it up, and the question is, who's in our virtual living room? Um, Chuck or Eileen, can you see it? Hi, Gail. Chuck just got a bump. He has a little issue. So let's Sorry. do it in text chat. No problem. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's use it in text chat. How many of you are library directors? Or supervisors, frontline staff, students, what, what kind of work position do you have? If you could just put that up in chat for us. Okay. Ah, and some folks are telling us our age. You can go ahead and do that if you, if you like. We were going to use it as a poll, ask your age as a poll so we wouldn't know your name. So anybody who's brave enough to volunteer their age, there's no video here. So we're not, we're not sending it out. <laughs> Okay, so we have got everything. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, that's great. What happens in WebEx stays in stays WebEx. In WebEx. I love it. Vegas rules here. Okay, so we do have 
folks from a variety of positions, and it looks like there are a lot of folks uh, approaching that age or in that age where we start to think about Act Three. And a couple of young ones. I like the hot 50s. I'm going to use Yay. that. Yay. <laughs> Too late for me. <laughs> oh. So here's a little about us. Paul? Yeah. All right. I'll start. So I don't know how it happens, but I'm 58, and I don't know exactly when that happens at all. I'm the one on the left, and truth be told, that's not my most recent picture. Um. As Eileen mentioned, I'm a consultant, and we've got clients all over the country. We have two people that work with me, and they're quite a bit younger, um, so I'm very concerned about them as well as I think about retirement. Now, my husband, Mike, is 66, which I used to think was old that I no longer do. <laughs> he retired two years ago after transitioning out of working three days a week, then two, then one, and so he, he's right into it and loves it. He has hobbies and doesn't know how he ever had time to work. I personally am embarrassed to say that I don't really have many hobbies and I really like working and learning. Mike would like me to work less, but I'm not ready financially or emotionally, so I realize that this is something I really need to start thinking about also, and I'm one of those who tend to teach what I need to learn, which brought me to here. And I work with Gail for over 10 years, and Gail, tell them a little bit about yourself now. Okay. Well, I'm 60, speaking of I don't know how that happened, and I've spent 35 years or so working in public libraries, 30 of them with the same organization. Now I'm working independently as a consultant, often with Paula. I might have gone to work for myself a number of years ago, but I was kind of risk averse as a single parent and on my own financially. Um, it just made good sense for me to stay in a job I loved long enough to have the security of a good pension and health benefits, and I am perfectly appreciative of what a rarity that is these days. I started building my consulting business back in the late 90s, retired from my last library job three years ago, and I've been pretty much full-time self-employed ever since. I don't consider myself actually retired, though. In my mind, I quit one job to take on another one. I do see myself working differently over the next few years or so, though. So, so if you could tell us briefly what made you choose this webinar in the chat. Are you all thinking about it also? Yeah. Okay. Ah, <laughs> somebody's <laughs> counting at me. Two weeks, two days. <laughs> Linda, I bet you're ready to go. <laughs> yeah, okay. do something Some different. Yeah, We're going to talk folks, about that. Yeah. Some folks are thinking ahead a few years. That's really um, very good to start thinking early. Yeah. Wondering how you will thrive without work, that's really a good thing to wonder about if you get a lot of your fulfillment from work, and we'll talk about that. Okay. Two years and what's next? And, you know, I think that's what I've been thinking about, too. What's next right. and is there a next and is it different or does it kind right. of just ooze along? Yeah. yeah, and I'm 50, Jennifer's 50. That is what we think is the time to start thinking about it. Right. So uh, as you think about your own retirement, what comes to mind? Is it, you know, perhaps fear, maybe some denial? I'm not ready yet. <laughs> oh, no, Freedom. I'm not going to retire. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> Freedom. Yeah. Um. Right. Do you think about your savings or a paid-off mortgage? You know, contrary to popular belief, a solid financial plan doesn't guarantee a satisfying retirement. Um, uh, there, a there's fear, a lot of yeah. research, yeah, about people who who really left satisfying careers into those well-funded dream retirements, and they wake up a few years later thinking, what did I do? There's something missing in my life, something very emotional and personal. 
Uh, yep, the fear of not being busy. To yeah, another you know. career, all sorts of things here, isn't there? Yeah. All mm-hmm. day in PJs. I love it, but some days that's overrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Will my body but, hold up? That is a, a really time. important question, right. isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I hope you're exercising now and doing preventive health and taking care of yourself. Right, right. So what what we're seeing is that uh, many people spend more time planning their two-week vacation than they do their retirement. So one of the things that occurred to us is that we should be looking at retirement planning the way we look at strategic planning. Yeah, and it is just not your mother's retirement anymore or your father's. We are living longer, working longer, have more options than ever before, and it's our time to reinvent retirement. We'll spare you the history of retirement, only to say that baby boomers are absolutely reinventing it as we're living longer and working longer. In a recent poll conducted by AARP, and I might add, it pains me a little bit to be looking at research by AARP, an organization (laughs) I never thought I'd join and frankly still haven't, but I do use their research. Um, Anyway, 70% of baby boomer participants said that they intend to work part-time or never retire. It's first generation. Our generation is likely to redefine traditional retirement from a time of leisure to a new phase of life that involves work in one way or another. We've heard research that retirees, like many millennials, will go through seven different so-called careers. One friend of ours spent two years babysitting grandchildren then one year learning golf and living a life of leisure. Not finding enough meaning or development in these activities, she is now volunteering in a local school and taking art classes, developing her creative side. We just heard that her former boss just asked her to run a project for four months, and she's probably going to do it. So it's pretty cool to be able to go back and forth and in and out of different activities. In addition, rather than being driven by your, quote, normal retirement age, perhaps there is another way that you all can look at retirement, that all of us can. Is working holding you up or holding you back? Is it sustaining you or squelching you? Is your job a leash or a lifeline? Those questions are probably more relevant in deciding when and how to retire than is the age on your driver's license. Regardless of your chronic age, there's also nothing wrong with keeping on working, even if you have solid financials to keep you going. That's an option. And because of having so many options, this can happen. Many organizations are bringing back retirees as contractors, consultants, mentors, et cetera, to retain valuable knowledge, and that's something we'll be talking about more next week in our webinar about knowledge transfer. And, Gail, that's something you did, wasn't it, as well? Absolutely. I did go back and do some coaching a little bit. Yeah, and um, means very strong connections with her prior organization. Mm -hmm. So as we look at how retirement is transforming, um, we see what's really interesting is that um, we're no longer worn out or sick. And productivity and development are key components of Act 3, whereas Act 3 is like the new act. It used to just go from Act 1 to 2, which we're now calling Act 4. Um, Lassett, in describing this stage of life, states that for the first time in history, we have a life stage that is significantly reduced responsibilities but continuing health and vitality. Um, We are all living longer. Retirement in Act 3, the retirement years, Nowadays, are not only filled with leisure activities, but are characterized by self-development, productivity, and leisure, as well as having flexibility, freedom, and fulfillment. Rather than being over the hill, people ages 50 to 75 could be climbing the summit, developing ourselves to our full capacity in an orientation toward life. Regardless of working, retired, or in between, That's less of a factor these days than our commitments to fully explore, develop, and express ourselves. So what we're saying is this is the time to be thinking about self-development. What do you really want to learn about? Productivity. If you could work at something you absolutely loved, other than library work, of course, 
what might that be? Could you afford to earn less money doing it or even doing it without pay solely for fulfillment and satisfaction? Can you imagine exploring career options that would allow you to get paid at something you love? And what about leisure? What would you want to do just for the sheer pleasure of it? Anything at all, playing piano, um, playing golf, just reading, sitting around reading books. I know somebody said that. Actually, right now that would be my thing. (laughs) <laughs> but Act 4 is actually the new third act. It starts at about age 80, 85 these days, and it is often characterized by failing health and leisure at this stage, but we've got a long time to go to get there. Now we're on Act 3. Um, so there are five emotional stages research has shown pertaining to retirement. Now, Honestly, there used to be four stages, but the economic crisis has added a new stage around hesitation as a result of the economic anxiety that we're feeling. So the imagination starting as much as 15 years beforehand, hesitation, anticipation, realization, um, starting at retirement day, oftentimes that hits you that first year, Uh, reorientation, which can go on for a while, and we'll be talking about it as a transition, and then reconciliation. Um, I'd say that I'm somewhere, me personally, between hesitation and anticipation. (laughs) Stock market definitely put a bit of a crimp in it, Um, so I'd say I'm there. Gail, where do you see yourself? Well, when I think about my last library job, the one I retired from, I put myself into the reorientation phase, and I think I've pretty much reoriented to a new full-time employment. Um, But it is, I do think of work much differently than I used to, and I have the freedom and flexibility now only to uh, take on those projects that are really interesting or exciting or that I can learn something from. So that definitely is reorientation, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's nice. I'm seeing in the chat a lot of people are at different stages from Mm -hmm. imagination to anticipation. Gail, right now I think you're the only one (laughs) who are forward, (laughs) but that makes perfect sense. That that makes sense. Thank you all for sharing this. I think it's very exciting. That's great. Um, So retirement. So this comes from Nelson and Bowles. You guys might remember this from um, What Color Is Your Parachute? So also seeing where we all are, they now have What Color Is Your Parachute in Retirement, which I think is pretty smart. So what they say is that retirement is changing in many, many ways. Before making the big decisions about um, retirement, it's important to think through some of these fundamental principles as you develop your strategies. So first off, retirement really is a career transition. It may be away from work or it could be from one career to another. It can be all at once or come gradually through a transition as my husband did. It can be voluntary or involuntary. You could choose the timing or you could be terminated, laid off, or offered an early retirement, too good to turn down, even if you're not quite ready. Um, It's definitely a stage of life. It's a life change that occurs over a period of time. Your experience is unique, and yet it also has much um, similar to other people. So as some of you brought up with health issues, yeah, it does include biological aging, uh, which I've noticed my body has been declining, and we all come closer to facing our own mortality. Mm -hmm. Ugh, hate that. Um, It does require economic support for an unknown time because we will still need money for as long as we live. It changes, retirement does change your level of engagement. Retirement increases or decreases your um, psychological and social engagement, but both tend to decrease over the course of your retirement um, and you're more alone. Uh, Retirement is definitely shaped by the earlier stages of your life. All of the domains of your life prior to retirement will affect your life during retirement. It all leads up and it's all who you are. Retirement, uh, your well-being, while it includes prosperity, health, and happiness, your well-being doesn't come from just economic security, physical health, or life satisfaction, 
but it comes from all three in combination. So if you had one or the other or two out of three, it's really not enough for a great retirement. You need a combination of all three. Um, so transition. As we're saying, retirement is a transition, and it can be a tough transition. Although it sounds like it's great, but it's still a transition. It's probably the first major life transition we face entirely on our own. There's no support group awaiting you as you drive home from your retirement party. In addition, many parts of your life change at one time. If you leave your job, your relationships with coworkers change along with others associated with work. You lose the status, influence, and power you had along with the structure of daily commitments, the physical workplace, the camaraderie, and even the daily commute. All that provided structure. And I might add that your relationship with the significant other changes as well, as does your relationship with your home and your money. Some research, excuse me, some researchers say that retirement can bring as much stress and emotional shock as a divorce or the death of a loved one. Many find retirement highly stressful and even overwhelming. Others prepare in advance and have a better experience, and that's what we'll be talking about. The preparation and starting in advance is really, really helpful. Um, this is a transition like any other. It's a developmental stage. It's a process, not a single event. It has implications for four major areas of our lives, psychological, social, financial, and health. And as Gail said, we're focusing on the psychological and social as well as the creation of a plan. If you look at handout number one, um, there's um, a handout on tips for helping managing with transition. And by the way, you can use these for any kind of transition. Um, so let's look at the stages of transitions. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are four stages in this model. And it's the process of moving from one phase of life to the next. So whether moving, marrying, or retirement, we basically move through four stages to proceed successfully through a transition. It's a little bit different than the Bridges model, but also very similar. So no matter what kind of transition you're going through, you must go through all four stages. Um, the first is to relinquish. Um, we need to uh, um, let go of current activities that must end, must disengage and let go, or relinquish the past that can't continue, can't keep showing up to work after you retire. This involves disengaging, ending former habits, and emotionally accepting the change. Letting go requires mourning the loss and making emotional space to look ahead instead of looking backwards. We must detach from old before attaching to the new. Next step that's suggested in this model is taking a recess, just like kids do in school or taking a gap year like kids have been doing now. Take a time out. Just stop. Pause to refresh and recreate. Take time and space to rest, recharge, and recreate. Really think about what it is you want to do before just charging ahead. Third step is about redefinition. Identify the ingredients of your new life and make a plan for the future. What are your new activities and pursuits? Make plans and try them out. This is a time where you can test drive. It's not like committing to a job where you know you've got to stick to for a couple years. Here you can really try something for a month. Go try a new location instead of moving. Just test drive it out, a new job, a new volunteer opportunity. Um, test it out and see how it goes. And then re-engage. Put your plan into action, and after a period of trial, learning, and practice, you can begin to re-engage with confidence and develop new habits. Okay. So let's talk about some of those elements of an ideal retirement. You see on this graphic a number of circles, and we're going to be talking about the com these components of an ideal retirement. They include retirement geography or place, sociology or relationships, strengths and personality, and the psychology of retirement, activities and values. Two other com components are important. Those are finances and health care, and again, we're not covering those here. Understanding yourself is really important 
before you start designing the next stage of your life. It's important to identify and activate your own core values. And activating your values means that you're conscious of them and motivated to use them in your everyday life. When you activate your values, you are more likely to act according to them. Living a alignment with your core values allows you to say, I lived a wonderful life and I did a good job. Values are your beliefs about what is desirable and undesirable, good and bad, right and wrong. Some of the values we hold are situational and apply to specific time periods. Do you know your most important core values? If you don't or you'd like a checkup, um, or like me, you love these kinds of tools, <laughs> and Paula likes them too. Uh, we have a couple that we'd suggest you take a look at. My Life Values Inventory is one of them, and viacharacter.org, and both of those links are here, and they're on our resource handout as well. Um, there are lots of other tools, too, but these are good ones, and they're free. The first one, My Life Values Inventory, measures independence, responsibility, achievement, humility, objective analysis, financial prosperity, belonging, creativity, concern for others. The list goes on and on. Um, another way to understand yourself is to assess your strengths. Retirement's not a time to work on fixing your weaknesses. Uh, rather, it's the time to know and build on your strengths, as well as, of course, to create some new ones. So this values in action classification of strengths, the via character.org is good for that. And there's another one called authentic happiness that will work. And you can get information about your personality style and what fulfills you. Uh, really, it's time to ask when you're starting to plan, what do you really value? Um, in their book, Don't Retire, Rewire, Jerry Sedler and Rick Miners urge us to know what you'll be leaving behind when you retire and then figure out how to replace that in the future. So how do you uh, figure that out? How do you sort out those things that are really important, that make you tick, from those things that you learn to consider important only because you got approval and rewards for them. Uh, we have a handout, Personal Turn-Ons and Turn-Offs, that will help you work through some of that. And one way is really to get a handle on this is to list what drives you to action. And then consider whether each factor makes the list because it genuinely reflects something you like about yourself or simply because you've been rewarded for it in the past. Review the motivators in the handout, in handout three, um, those mostly intangible things that are important to us, that stimulate and excite us, that cause us to do what needs to be done and provide us with a sense of satisfaction and well-being. They're the things that make us feel that we belong somewhere and they're what we crave such as getting recognition from others and being part of a stimulating, fun work team. If you have a need to feel vital, have power, be of service, if you're energized by brainstorming stimulating ideas, a life of exercise classes and the symphony are not going to be enough. You know, you can start with this list of factors on the handout, but you can feel free to add others as they occur to you. Anything that would motivate you or would drive you crazy if they were no longer part of your life. Um, it's also a good idea to note each factor that's important to you now and then review the list again with an eye toward the factors you can imagine will or will not be important to you five years from now. That is, what's situational? Uh, one way to start to understand this is to ask ourselves which things we can't do without and which motivators we want to be rid of. Understanding this helps answer such questions as, if I have opportunities to get meaningful work in a new field, 
is a hefty salary essential? Will my self-confidence dwindle if there's no one there to applaud me? Aww. I know. So Aww. sad. <laughs> um, I tell you what, I missed my team when I retired. <laughs> Just that cam- camaraderie day to day. You know, if I'm no longer stressed or challenged each day, will my brain turn to bone, <laughs> or will I have any energy anymore? Will I, I actually feel- worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, whenever <laughs> I worry about that, going. Paula, I call you and we figure out a way to work together. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> Good point. <laughs> <laughs> and. Sometimes people do feel inadequate without a job title. You know, if your ego has been wrapped up in uh, who you are in the community and your title is part of that, what happens when that's gone? So here are some things that people do find fulfilling and their ideas for you to think about in terms of what fulfills you. Not just what fulfills you, but which of the things that fulfill you are you primarily getting from work now? Once you know what has fulfilled you in the past, you can make a mindful decision about what you're going to seek in the future. The key questions have to do with your activity style. Will you see fulfillment from cooperative pursuits and helping others? Or are you going to seek solitary pursuits, more focused on independent accomplishment? and self-development, or maybe some combination. Success in Act 3 depends on your decisions about your sources of personal fulfillment. Okay, so again, how much is coming from your work? Don't turn your back on your career until you know what you're leaving behind. (laughs) Good point. Yeah, really, what about your social connections or the recognition that comes from work? Maybe part-time work would be something you would want to continue. Whether or not you leave your job, what sources of fulfillment from your work will you continue to seek? Service, creativity, influence, recognition? What new sources of fulfillment, if any, will you seek now that you haven't sought before? Even if you like your job, Maybe you'll want to do something totally different. No more working in libraries. I'm going to work in the garden shop. (laughs) (laughs) Bookstore, if there are any left. (laughs) (laughs) wonder if Amazon's taking anyone on. Um, Really, this whole idea of personality style is kind of complementary to strengths because what you like to do, you tend to practice and get better at. So looking at whether you're outgoing or more contemplative, um, whether you thrive on stress or whether you'd prefer not to have much of it, your activity style, whether you uh, really like to work autonomously or whether you like better being part of a team, um, your Information style, um, how you process information by focusing more on details or the big picture, your outlook, the way you make decisions, your prioritizing, and your planning style. Um, really, all of these preferences these that play into your personality style have a lot to do with how you're going to seek fulfillment. Why is it important? Who you are just determines what fulfills you and what doesn't. If you're outgoing, spending lots of time alone in that isolated mountain cabin, even though the view is gorgeous, is just not going to fulfill you, since outgoing folks have high needs for social contact. Or if you're independent, you might not feel fulfilled working with a team unless, of course, you're in charge. Um, because independent people have high needs for autonomy. So when you understand your personality traits, you can choose activities that fit who you are. Um, 
again, it's important because it determines how you make choices in life. If you understand yourself and remain aware of your personal preferences and habits, you can use them to your advantage. But if you're not so aware of your personality preferences, you might get into trouble as you transition into retirement. For example, if you take a structured approach to planning, you might decide too quickly and zoom into a full-time consulting job um, or a beach resort far away from an airport or babysitting your new grandchild until kindergarten and spend too little time gathering information and exploring options before committing to a course of action. So if you become aware that you tend to rush to judgment, you can approach your transition to retirement a little more thoughtfully. Okay. So what kind of activities do you see yourself doing when you finish full-time work? Um, oh. Why don't you put some of those in chat and tell us what you see yourself doing. Some of you mentioned things before, but what do you think you, they are? And Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Cool. cool. I look forward to that book. And as you write it, and I'm not giving us much time to just do this in the interest of time, I want to take more courses too. Um, what of the activities that you're thinking about are fun and pleasurable? And which of the activities you're thinking about do you think will engage you, and which are meaningful? These three categories, pleasure, engagement, and meaningful, come from positive psychology, the work of Martin Seligman. And what they're saying is that um, those that are pleasurable are just those where you have fun in an easy and relaxed way, where you get bursts of positive emotions that come and go quickly. Those that are engaging involve flow. And flow happens when your abilities are well matched to some challenging tasks. You need to look at your interests as well as your skills and strengths. And strengths, as the um, little assessment, that are like personality traits, and you can see them in the assessment Gail mentioned. They are the intrinsic and enduring behaviors that are always positive. Um, Bowles and Nelson suggest, and I love this, that we view strengths as the paint color on an artist's palette. If you look back over the scenes of your life, you'll notice that over time, you've been painting with the same colors. Meaningful activities come from using your abilities in the service of something larger than yourself, being in service. That meaning doesn't come from just believing in something larger than yourself or writing a check to it, but it comes from actually being in service to that something and doing something about it. And this is the part of living your life in alignment with your values. So today, in today's retirement, psychology research tells us that lasting happiness in Act 3 is linked to a critical factor that the fun and enjoyment approach overlooks, engagement. The old model of retirement was sometimes even described as disengagement, and that's not what we want for our new retirement as we're young and healthy. And how do we get it? Through identifying our strengths those talents and abilities that we receive great satisfaction in using. If you find meaning in a fulfilling career, that's great. If your sense of meaning and purpose comes from something outside of your work, that's great because you won't be leaving it behind when you retire or move to Act 3. Indeed, Act 3 is a wonderful time to discover or rediscover your purpose. In your picture of your ideal retirement, See yourself using your strengths in the service of something that you believe in and really, really enjoy doing. And if you see yourself not alone in these scenes but connecting with others, so much the better. Because if you do, you're envisioning both elements of the happiness dimension, the psychological and the social, which is about relationships, and we'll talk about that next. So something to keep in mind about relationships is that there is no automatic relationship generator as you move into retirement. Um, I don't know if you've thought about that, but I hadn't. And relationships are the next component of an ideal retirement that must be considered. Up until retirement, they come from school and work and kids' schools, neighborhoods, sports teams, school events, religious community, new jobs, and so forth. These generators keep creating social networks for us, and we just don't have that anymore. Hmm. Maybe the senior center. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Anything not ready <but>. yet. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely not. 
So what are relationships? Relationships are those that are based on trust and reciprocity, and you know what that is, but also bonding and bridging, which I hadn't really thought about. Bonding relationships are with people who are like you and as you define it. And these people are a source of support for you. So some examples might be friends who are library employees, members of your religious community, and these folks provide you strong ties. Those in your social network who are not like you are those with whom you have bridging relationships. That is, they cross over your differences to have the relationship. You rely on these people for information rather than support. And the fact that they're not like you means that they are more likely to have some sources of information that you don't, which is very helpful. So by bridging out, you tap into additional sources of information, and these folks provide your weak ties. Going into Act 3, you'll need a strong network for making life transitions, bonding relationships for support, but bridging relationships for information. And remember that jobs and even volunteer opportunities um, often come from the bridging relationships, not from um, the bonding ones. So there are three levels of relationships that parallel the three activities, and the same thinking can be applied to happiness that you get from your social connection and relationships. The first level is about pleasant, lighthearted fun, people you just enjoy hanging out with. Second is about engagement, using your skills and strengths for a well-managed challenge. These relationships are based on shared flow experiences. And Gail and I, I will say, have both. We enjoy hanging out, and we also really get into the flow when we're working on an engaging task. Mm -hmm. And the third is about meaning. Um, and we see this sometimes with library staff working on community projects, such as early childhood or adult literacy. Retirement will change many of these relationships, especially based in work. So real quick, as we're ending, getting late, I'm going to talk about place. Um, place, and do a chat on this because this is fun. Where would you like to live after you retire? Have any of you thought about that? Would you like to move somewhere else? And while you're doing <laughs> that, let's mountains, yeah, let's flip into the next slide, and I'm going to talk about the model that um, is a Bulls model also. Um, that he calls sale, and I love it because it's so obvious, of course. Um, but the sense of place is the meaning that you derive from a geographical location. It's that inner layer, the connection that you feel to a place, your emotional reaction to it, and it's something different for all of us. And I see that I see ocean but can't afford it. That would be me. Mm -hmm. So we've got the ocean, the mountains where it doesn't rain so much, um, but what place really connects with you. The A is about aging in place, what most people want to do in their retirement residence, where we wind up. Research shows that people want to age in place. When the time comes, we will all need assistance with the activities of daily living. Ugh, I hate to think about that, too. Mm -hmm. Well, this is an act for older person question. The time to think about it is before we actually need that assistance. The decisions we make at this point will determine far down the road how long we can live in our own home. And I would bet that some of you are grappling this with your parents right now, or at least I am. Um, the third is the livable community. And that would be a supportive environment for retirement and aging. The area around your home that you typically travel within to fulfill your needs and desires. So how far to Starbucks, to your church or synagogue, to the library, to go out to dinner and a movie with a friend, to see friends and families. You can think about your current community now and how livable it would be through your retirement years. And I will say, for example, like with my mom, um, she'll drive a little bit, but she'll drive three to five miles, which is enough to take her into her community. Um, then there's the essential region, which is the macro layer. The part of the country that you absolutely must live in, um, if you have one. Is there a region that supports you socially or where your most important relationships are? Maybe not next door, but easy travel. Or a part of the country that offers compelling opportunities to use your skills or pursue interests and passions? And what about a part that's supportive of your health as you get older? Maybe someplace warmer, 
someplace easier to live financially with a lower cost of living than California, or maybe you go to live with friends or family. Now, these are good questions, and remember that the answers to them will change over time. And, of course, this doesn't mean that you should sell your place and move, rather that you should start evaluating your current place according to these four different layers. That way, if you decide to stay where you are, it will be the result of a conscious decision. So, as a way of uh, wrapping up what we've been saying, the time to start thinking about your retirement is now. What can you do now, even if you're in an early phase before Act 3? One of the things that the research tells us is that a third of the people have a plan, a third are working on a plan for retirement, and a third of us may be totally stymied without a clue as to how to get started on a plan. So try on some of the things on this list. You know, it's never too soon to start nurturing those close relationships or giving of yourself or working on your networks. Um, this last bullet, Paula, I think is all yours. Marriage your significant <laughs> other on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> think, um, <laughs> think about the relationship that you have now. It's going to be more intense. So if it's fabulous, it'll probably be even more fabulous. Um, if it needs a little work, now's the time to work, work on, on it. it. Yeah, because you're going to have more space and more time to be together, and that can be good and in some cases not so good. And we're actually seeing an increase in people getting divorced at retirement time. Right. So, Yeah. Right. So maybe if you have a spouse or significant other, you want to take some classes together, right? You know, that would be something to do. Or have those conversations that you've been putting off having. Absolutely. And maybe a conversation together to have together is who are we going to be once one or both of us stop working? Mm -hmm. You know, it's about me, but it's also about us. What, mm -hmm. you know, what losses are there going to be? What, what can we let go of? What else can we do? And remember, there are lots of options. Uh, for some of us, um, leaving a work life behind is just fine. You know, it's that last bullet. It's my turn now. Uh, I've done everything for everybody else, so it's my turn to volunteer, to help my kids, to just enjoy being free of commitments, just to listen to my inner voice. But for others of us, there are lots of different ways to transition um, away from work, and that may include having, maintaining some kind of a working life. Um, downshifting or phased retirement, two of those bullets there. Uh, my brother-in-law worked for the federal government, and he, when he retired from his Defense Department job, he took what was called a soft landing. He went to work for a contractor for a while. And so it was the kind of work that he had done in an environment that was familiar but different and part-time. So that's an interesting way to think of downshifting as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so earlier we asked you what comes to mind when you think about your retirement. So we just want to check in again um, after this webinar, what comes to mind now when you think about your retirement. Choices. I like that. What else? There are choices and options. Yeah, it is a yeah. process. Yeah, it certainly is not just an event. Yeah, certainly not a yeah. one. Need to do yeah. more you know, if you all don't go away with anything but that, that's fabulous. <laughs> and we, if, the will, it, will it surprise you to know we have a handout to help you with that? <laughs> uh, in fact, if you go take a look at that handout later, um, you'll see that one of the things uh, you can do is that you can identify things you want to continue doing things you want to do more of, or even things you'd like to test drive. You know, you don't have to make a full-out, long-term, lifelong commitment to something. This is a time to try things on. Yeah, instead of moving to Arizona before you do that, maybe rent a house for a month and see if you really love it as much as you think you're going to. Right. Okay. 
oh, I like that, make sure I'm engaged. It's only the current stress that makes me think I want to live on the moon. Mm, good point. Mm-hmm. Your stressors will be different. That's for sure. So in the, the few minutes we have left, we'd like to know what's one step you'll take in the next month to move you along the Act 3 path. And you might want to think about what you can do in the next six months as well. But if you wouldn't mind sharing an answer to that first question in the chat box, one step you'll take in the next month to move you along, we would love to see it. You know, um, one of you just said, uh, Sarah, that you wish your organization would let you trans transition into part-time work. One thing I've learned is ask them. Make them an offer. Make them an offer they can't refuse. Maybe find somebody else who wants the job share. Don't just assume that it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Talk about Great. it with spouse. Yeah, I think having that conversation. Um, yeah, money. Mm -hmm. Location. Yeah, the current town Focusing I have a great house, and there's no way this place will meet my retirement needs. I'm <laughs> conscious enough to know that I will not have a, a house with steps next time. And also, like some of you said, I want to be able to walk to places, mm -hmm. not have to drive 20 minutes. Right. Oh, work with recording for the blind. You know, that is work, and it's meaningful, isn't it? That's yes. wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> Multi-level house. I'm thinking about that too. Yeah, Gail's is two yeah. stories. Yeah. 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 I never so thought we... I'd be thinking about that. Mhm. Mm lots to think about. Lots and lots to think about. So we do have some handouts to help you with that process. And wondering questions. if, yeah, if you have any questions. And please put them in the question, the Q and A box. Oh uh, yeah, the relationships that you've let flag. Yeah, I'm with you, Nancy, on that. I want to call my friends from high school that I just see every mm -hmm. ten years. Any questions or points you want to share? Gail, how has the adjustment been for you? Well, actually, as I said, I, I pretty much thought of myself as going from one job to another. And the biggest adjustment I had in the beginning was not having full-on, full-time contact with the network, the professional and uh, social network around work that uh, I realize now was very important to me. So I have pursued a lot of those relationships, you know, offline, and I've found other ways to connect, um, done some work for my professional organization, for example, mm -hmm. and, take, and taken on some local projects, um, not just ones that get me on an airplane. <laughs> ah, some oh, somebody I know from Anne Arundel County, which is where I live, and I have worked with their library as well, yeah. So... Yes, so one thing I found is that networks really do, um, they, they connect you to people all over the place. It's a small world, it's a small profession that we're in, actually, and, all, and information is our business. So just about everybody knows somebody who knows somebody, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's very comfortable and easy to reestablish and strengthen some of those contacts if you just pay attention to it. Right. Well, Eileen is suggesting Facebook, which is absolutely, absolutely. true. That's a good point. And Eileen, why don't you friend me? <laughs> <You're not myself. laughs> okay. Well, I'm very well, glad all of you have been able to attend. We've really enjoyed this. And I see some of you did, too. I hope you'll have a chance to look at the handouts. Um, of course, we didn't have time to go through them while on the webinar, but I think you'll be able to do that and hopefully get something from it.
And we'd um, like to put in a plug for our webinar next week. Oh, yeah. called what, it's called What Will Happen When I'm Gone, and it's about knowledge transfer. If you are the one planning to leave or if it's your coworker, your colleague, your boss, uh, whether retirement is the reason or whether perhaps your library is downsizing and people with valuable information are walking out the door, the time to think about how to to hang on to that is now. And we'll be talking about some ways that libraries have been pretty effective in doing it. So please join us next week. Next Tuesday, December 13th at noon Pacific. Thanks, Eileen. And don't and so, forget to fill out the um, evaluation. Right. Yes. And thank you, uh, Gail and Paul. And you obviously struck a chord with people. So this is great <laughs> information. <laughs> Including me, I'm I'm in imagination, but but I can dream. <laughs> yeah, I know the ocean. <laughs> I saw that, Eileen. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is a reminder to everybody: we are archiving this webinar, and it'll be available at the link where the handouts are as well. So feel free to share this with your coworkers and other people that you may know who are at that period of life about thinking about Act Three. And uh, hopefully, we will see you at uh, next week at uh, Gail and Paula's next webinar. So thanks again for attending. Bye. Bye.